ready to start. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the second half of the first workshop of our 2017 Extraordinary Technology Conference. David Garraway is demonstrating abilities and the techniques to detecting etheric waves. So he's going to be continuing and we're going to be doing some Q&A here pretty soon and some hands-on demonstration. At some point he's also going to be assisted by John Fiala. And if, as a matter of housekeeping, when you come up to ask questions, if you could stand in the green box and go to the microphone. That would be great. Thank you very much. Take it away, David Garraway. All right. Am I on? Test, test. One, two, three. Thank you very much. I appreciate your, your applause. It's wonderful to have people to talk to about this. And, and hello? Hello? Okay, we're, we're there. Right? Okay, good, good. Uh, as I just demonstrated, the symbol is sanded in those fractal patterns uh, that describe where, where the ether bunches up in the spiral as it goes in. And what happens is it adds a wobble to the atoms of the surface of the symbol. So when you spin it, it actually, the, the atoms soak up a little more time space than the atoms of a normal symbol would. And when it stops spinning, it gives back a little bit of the time space that it soaked up. So you see it actually moving backwards just a little bit. So it's not an illusion, or it is an illusion. It's hard to say exactly what's, uh, what to call it, but it's a phenomenon that uh, I've observed. I did all kinds of experiments with these... Um, patterns. And uh, same with these mirrors. I uh, sanded these mirrors in those patterns. And this gentleman sh just had a, a dowsing uh, pendulum. And they went wild over these mirrors. I tried an experiment yesterday to see if they would gather more light outside. And it didn't go over that well. But I'm hoping today at the end of this, con uh, t you know, talk, not conference. At the end of this talk, I hope we can go outside, throw these in a bucket of water, and see if the reflections aren't just a little bit brighter than they should be. Because these mirrors actually, in my experience, they help pull in photons, more light than usual. So, um, and that's what the symbol does. It pulls in a little more energy than usual. So is there anybody that hasn't seen me spin the symbol yet that would like to see it spin? Come on up, please. Because uh, it's, it's really hard to see. You've got to be next to it to see it. Actually, David, uh, uh, could we spin one, this one time without the audience uh, crowded around it so the cameras can get the shot? Oh, okay. You know, so, okay? Well, and uh, um, the, uh, yeah, the, what the, they can they look up on the screen there. Oh, okay. Yeah, you're not going to see it like this, though. You're going to need to change the, the contrast or something. Yeah, that might do it. All right, let's see if we can... Get the camera down a little bit, maybe. Okay, give it a shot here. This effect seems to happen a little better when the spinning is counterclockwise, too. Come on, come on, get back up there. So if anybody wants to see this up close and personal, I'd be glad to show it to you. I'll be here all five days, and I'd be glad to make one of these coils for you or discuss anything or show you how to make one of these symbols or mirrors or whatever. Whoa. Ah. Of course, when it's on camera, right? <sighs> okay. Okay. Let's see if that helps.
I've always thought it was interesting. It spins longer one way than it does the other. No. Yeah, it's subtle. It really doesn't come across on video. You, it'd have to be looking straight down on it. We can cheat on spinning it up to speed. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Let's go for it. Why don't, we try it. why don't we try it like on the ground in front of the camera? So. You think that might work? Better toys. I mean, power toys. Okay. You think that might work better? Yeah, try it counterclockwise. Oh, wow. Is it interfering with the camera? All right. Very nice. Thank you. Turn around that little metal thing because it's hard to, you know, it's going to slow it down a lot faster, isn't it? Yeah. I guess we get, but the angle's better on the camera. Yeah. Yeah, it's got an interesting video effect. Just a little bit more charted on that. Yeah. See if we can... Ah, there you go. Yeah, it's interesting how it oscillates on a video camera. Seems, oh. It seems to be interfering with it, too. Well, that's, uh, that's actually out the back side on the console there. That's where the interference is coming, but it's huh. after. Well, I've actually drawn uh, pictures of these coils on paper using those fractal numbers. And when I was done uh, drawing the pictures, when I crumpled up the paper and it caused static on a radio in the room. Uh, yeah, it is. Brass symbol. Huh. And you were telling me yesterday. Hmm. Cool. Thanks for telling me. I didn't know that. Even non-ferromagnetic materials will do that. Okay. Anything that's conductive will do that. If it can conduct an electron, anytime you move an electron, what also do you have? A magnetic field, right? Anytime you have a magnetic field that passes over a conductor, you get a movement of what? Electrons. So when there's one, there's the other. Anytime there's anything conductive, whether it's ferromagnetic or not, uh, uh, is uh, indifferent. So you think that field, that, that the magnetic field might be causing this distortion? On the, uh oh. Oh well. Let's see what happens. That's the first time I've used a drill or you know, seen it use a drill. Now if you want to try it on that little metal plate, we could do that too. Is that a yes? Yeah, sure, let's try it there. Maybe try it right handed this time. All right. <laughs> wow, a little extra spin to it now. Billiards, anybody? <laughs> yes. Hmm. Now, you know what? That was an experiment. Mm -hmm. How many times did Tom and I always had us an experiment with the uh, carbon uh, combusted uh, uh, filament? Over a thousand, huh? Well, we learned new, one new thing about the experiments today. Don't play billiards in the middle of it. I mean, a ballroom floor. No. It may stabilize somewhere in the, toward the end there. Yeah, hopefully. That is a weird phenomenon. You know, it normally doesn't do that. Really? You no. Know, ah, that plate is leaning at an angle. Hmm. 
That's what it is. That plate's not perfectly plumb. There it goes. It's funny because it's a left-handed spin, but it's going to right, right around. Very musical. Wow. Yeah, a little bit, not much. Yeah, still, yeah. Uh, oh well. Of course, and again, Thanks. we put it on probably the worst possible surface we could imagine. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, it somehow still, still work. Hmm. Go figure. Better than nothing. There you are. All right. So I guess I should get around to actually making one of these coils or showing how I do it. Uh, it's just a regular roll of solder and a measuring tape and a little masking tape and uh, <clears throat> these are the dimensions of the first coil would be right left so this would be 8 and this would be 8.8 .8. and this one would be 13 here so the first uh, measurement would be 13, and then after this, I don't know if I'll make a whole one, because that would take a long time, but I'll start it. And then after this, I'll show you how I sand the, the, the mirrors and the symbol. And then we can go outside and see if I can do one last demo that might work today. I don't know. Let's we'll see. I didn't have much luck yesterday. So this is measure out 13 inches, and then make a 90 degree bend. And then measure out 8.8. And bend that right. I mean, you're always going right at first here. And it pays to maybe mark it where it is. And rather than just make the loop, which you could, and you always want to fold it back over so it's going to wind up on this side, because you want to maintain as much tension uh, in your tensor as possible. But what you want to do is impart those fractal patterns to the loop. So you go right, right, right. And then you're bending it right, more right than left, so a little left than right. Then one, two, three, four, five left. Then one, two, three, four, five, six right. Then one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, twelve left. And one right. And then you do that same pattern left handed, left, 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 right, left, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one. And then by the third time you should make contact, right, 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 left, right, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, one. And then up oh, it's getting lopsided, so now you want to unbend it. You want them even as possible. Left, 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 right, left. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. And there you have your loop. And I'm not really doing it right because you should twist as you bend too. It's kind of tricky though. So you make this all the way over, which of course will destroy your geometry and force you to go back and start uh, using that right-handed pattern again. Right, 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 
left, right, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Then you're going to be using your left-handed pattern. <clears throat> oh, I need some water here. Uh, I can do this down here. Um, which would be left, 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 right, left, right. One, two, left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, left. One, two. And then one, two, three, four, four. One, 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 two. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two. And by the third time, you should be getting there. Left, 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 right. Uh, four left. One, two, three, four. Right, left, right. Left, left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And twelve. Okay, now more measuring tape. Oh. I don't think I've ever done this before, anybody. And I didn't measure it out either, so I'm going to kind of start again here. This has to be 8.8, 10% longer. 8.8, here, okay. Anyway, B. Second pattern, which is four to the left, 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 right, left, right. One, two, left. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, right. One, two, left. Then right, 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 right. Left, right, left. Right, right. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, left. Right, right. And one, two, three, four. One, two. Six, seven, one, two. And it should come on this side here. And you want to go down again, 90 degree angle. And measure out eight. And the second level is also right-handed. So make a 90 degree turn. Try to line it up with the first loop, first right-handed loop as much as possible. And then this is only five units long. So this would be five. And again, you want to do right, 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 left, right. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one. Left, 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 right, left. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. One. Right, right, right. Left, right. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. One. And it has to go on this side. I kind of blew that. You always kind of have to start over when you get it over on the right side here. So right, 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 left, right, one, and here, right, one, and here, six, one, and here, one, and here, one, and here, one, and then measure out 5.5 .5 on this side. So I don't think I'll do this entire coil here because it'd take me all day. It takes a couple hours really to make a good one. 5.5. And try to get it level. And then the left-handed one is left, 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 right, left, right. Five, six, seven, one, two, one, two, one, four, five, six, seven, one, two. And here, all right. And you can also go backwards to get the other waves, too. So you can go one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, right, left, right. Left, 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 left. Right, 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 left, right. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two. 
And finally you bend it down again. And then the final one down here, this will be just five. Well, I think you guys get the general idea here. I don't want to take up all your time doing this. But um, if you want me to show you how to make one, I mean, would anybody want me to go on with this any longer? <laughs> or is he seen enough? That's what I thought. <laughs> okay, fair enough. So that's how you make a coil, basically. You measure out the Fibonacci series, and you impart those twistings as you go along. On this side, it's 3, 1, 1, 5, 6, 12, 1. And on this side, it's 4, 1, 1, 1, 2, 7, 2. And as long as you're twisting and bending with these fractal numbers in mind, you're resonating with the imploding ether waves, and you'll help catch them. And it takes quite a while. I mean, I could stand here all day and do this, and it would take me an hour to make one good coil. <coughs> as far as the symbol goes in these mirrors, these are much more easily done with those patterns. Basically, you sand the mirror, start on the chrome side. The idea is to take the paint off and a little bit of the chrome, but not all of the chrome. So you go right in, right, right, then left out, and right in, and one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five, six, in. Two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, out, then in. Can we? Can you move that over just a little bit so it shows up on the big screen while you're doing it? Oh, okay. Hey, wonderful. Yeah, move that, move that felt marker yeah, and just do it right there. Okay. And then left-handed pattern. One, two, three, four. And the idea is to use a battery and a magnet inside your sandpaper so you get a little bit of current flow going. And it'll impart the wobble to the atoms in the chrome much better. So there is a battery with magnets in here. <clears throat> and you want to use both the left and right patterns. So you do left, 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 right, left, right, left, left, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, left, left, then right, 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 left, right, left, right, right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <sighs> and to get the best results, you might wind it up a little bit before you go right. So if I'm using a right-handed pattern, you might wind it up a little like that, and then go right, 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 then wind it up left, and go left, wind it right, go right, and then left, left, and four, five. And so by winding it up, you're wobbling the atoms in the sandpaper, and you're getting more rotation. And then unwind it, one, two, three, four, five, six. And uh, that's how it's done. And you just do that for like an hour or so. And uh, you can make a mirrored surface or a symbol, just like that. It'll catch ether waves. And uh, any questions? Yeah, are those uh, by filer? Are those by filer coils? By filer. Uh, well, you do the patterns both ways. Yeah, you start it right, left, right. You know, you do the pattern like this one is. Right three, left one, right one, then five, left six. And you start it over again, you do it, you start left. So yeah, you do that both is, the patterns left and right. That is by filer, because you have two opposing fields Some portions out. of it are by filer, some are not. That's producing scalar waves, basically, or cohering scalar waves. That's it, yeah. Totally. So you have, really, you're, you have four different wave forms. You have two right-handed forms and then two left-handed forms. And then if you do them backwards, you do those both left and right. Like I said, we're basically trying to harvest the right in waves and the left out waves. That's what these forward patterns do. So I basically stick to the forward pattern left and right, right sided, and the forward pattern left and right, left sided. But occasionally, like one out of every five times, I'll get bored and I'll try to catch the other waves by going backwards. I'll go one, you know, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, then six in, and then five out, and then one in and three out. So that way, eventually, you're getting all the soup, you know, hopefully, in your uh, equation. 
But if you, you know, it's very labor intensive and very time consuming and whatnot. So basically, although I should probably evenly do them all, I basically go right in and left out. And that produces the best results for me. So, but I'm glad you brought that up because you know, I very rarely go backwards when I should a good deal of the time. I think those also could be used for healing. Definitely, yeah. I think these coils, like I say, um, capture the right-handed force a lot more than the left-handed force. And that is the force of healing. And it, it will accelerate healing and, and plant growth, as I showed that lentil experiment does. And uh, I think there's a lot of potential in that. I'm going to have to start doing a lot more biological experiments. I'm working with an acupuncturist, and um, she has put needles on the end of these, you know, attached electrodes to needles, put them on the other end of this coil, and done acupuncture with them and reported really good results. The patients get tingly sensations and stuff like that. So I think it really does uh, capture chi and channel, you know, energies like that. So uh, I think there's a lot of potential in this. I know my presentation is a little clumsy. I'm getting tired and it's hard to do these on, you know, in front of people because it makes me nervous. I've never done one in front of a crowd before. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I appreciate your patience. And, uh, you know, it's a lot of fun to talk about them, though, because um, get some really interesting results. And uh, any other questions? The more the merrier. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was wondering about your Lagrangian. And mm -hmm. does that compare to, like, a block wall and a magnet? Is that, you know, the block wall and the magnet where you got the center where the spins flip? Mm -hmm. your, your Lagrangian, the video, you mean? Yeah, your, your Lagrangian field. Um, you explain your Lagrangian field? Oh, the Lagrangian walls, I call yeah, them. Because yeah. there's a Lagrange point between any two planets, for instance. Okay. But there's a field, there's like a wall between any objects. Like between here and here, there's a point here. And then between here and here, you could, you know, draw a line from this point to this point. And then a line from this point to this point. You could draw lines between any two objects all over the place. So the wall is very convoluted. It would be between you and you okay. uh, on this plane. It would be between this and the, and the solder on this plane. So, and of course, it's between this and any air molecule, too. So the walls surrounding things are all dependent on what's surrounding the thing. So there's a wall that surrounds you, but it's all dependent on the person sitting next to you and you know, the wall in the corner of the room and where the mic is and stuff like that. So it's a very convoluted envelope and it's constantly changing. If one thing moves, the entire shape of the envelope changes. Okay, I was just wondering if that could be compared to a block wall and a magnet, you know, where you got the center, but maybe. maybe. I think so, probably, you know. It would, it would apply to magnetic fields too, I think. And electrical, yeah. And one really. of the, what were you trying to do there with the symbol? What were you trying to demonstrate? I'm, I'm sorry I missed that. Well, I can show you later. Okay. It just soaks up a little time space, and then it gives it back when it stops, and you can see it reverse direction after it stops. It radiates out, you know, a little time. It goes back to where it was. Does it matter if those loops are shorted together? Does that make any difference, or if they're separated, or...? Or maybe I'm, maybe I'm misunderstanding something about how this works, actually. You mean the ends of the coils? Yeah, where, where you have these apparent vertexes of the loops where they go inward. Mm -hmm. I know they look like they're shorted together. Um, I kind of like to make them so they didn't short out at all and you could run current through them. I mean, you can still run current through them and uh, they have some effects, but... Um, I really don't think they, it matters if you short them out. Because okay. you're not really running current through them. You're, you know, the current that runs through them naturally runs through them. It takes the easiest path, which is going to be along the wire itself. And it's not going to want to short out. Okay, uh, maybe I'm misunderstanding. It's not for harvesting electricity, is it? No, it's not for harvesting. I mean, John Fiala here is great at harvesting electromagnetic fields and ambient uh, energy and stuff like that. This is just harvesting a little bit of the ether energy in the... Uh, okay, material. so I'm uh, glad you made that distinction then. Is that just aluminum solder that you're using? Yep, aluminum and tin. Tin and lead and or aluminum. 
Thank Did you, you want to talk about energy harvesting or? Yeah, this is just probably a good time to okay. dive in on that. You know, there's subtle fields, or weak fields, and there's strong fields, EM fields. Um, as we mentioned earlier, anytime you have a EM field that passes over anything that's conductive, whether it's ferromagnetic or not, you generate um, a, uh, a current, you know, electron flow. And, you know, those, what are those big things that, you know, when you, when you're in school, you had that little bar magnet and you laid the sheet of typing paper on it and you sprinkled the iron filings and you get those, what do they call those lines of? Magnetic flux. Magnetic flux, that's what it was, you know. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Every time you cut a conductor with 10,000 lines of flux, you get one volt amp or one watt. Okay, now. Okay, John, that's really great. That's basic electronics. I learned that in elementary school. Thank you. You know, okay. What is, how does that play here? Well, sometimes, you know, we were talking about, somebody asked a question about healing fields. All the molecular structures in your body are polar. You know, sometimes when you have blood vessels that have, um, that, uh, that are not flowing very well, you can excite them and get them flowing again. The flow of blood and oxygen increases. You have stored uh, toxins, heavy metals, you can release them. You know, we were looking at the uh, plants, you know, the two jars there. You can take an EM field that is sympathetic to the organic structure that uh, you're working with and increase the flow the same way we just talked about the uh, flow of blood and oxygen, you know, nutrients, you know, to the, you know, maybe the dermal or subdermal tissues damaged, you know, but we increase the, well, in that plant, we can cause the sap, you know, and the nutrients to run better. All of a sudden, the plant grows better. Now, you know, um, oh, wait a minute. We talked about energy harvesting a bit ago, didn't we? You used that word. Did he use that word? Did he say that out loud? I did. Yeah, he did. Oh, okay. Um, well, you, you know, just, you know, the easiest energy field to harvest is one that's moving. One that's stationary, you know, where the lines of flux are stationary, is that moving along a conductor and cutting lines of flux? That's kind of hard to harvest that, isn't it? But if it's a moving field, if there's anything moving about it, you know, you can, just like a bicycle pump or a, you know, well pump, you know, it's got the, you can put a check valve on this end and a check valve on that end, and you can get it to flow and stay, you know, you know, you pushed it out through the check valve and it stayed there. And, you know, and when you came back, it didn't suck it back in, it drew in some more. Well, part of the problems with harvesting a lot of energy is that check valve for the diode rectifier. Um, some of them, you know, like if you take a bicycle pump and you short stroke it, you know, and you're trying to pump up 32 PSI in your bicycle and you're at 26, but you're sitting there pumping and short stroking, maybe doing a lot of, there's a lot of energy going on there, but are we actually getting anything into the inner tube or the tire? We haven't reached the point where the check valve you know, comes off its seat and we begin, you have to go full stroke. Well, on some of those to actually begin to harvest, you know, some of that energy that, you know, you know, we're putting on a lot of sweat, a lot of effort, you know, but nothing's getting done, you know, it's a whole lot of work going down, you know. But, uh, so, oh, wait a minute, John, we need a better rectifier. Good question, good, that, I'm glad you told me that, thank mm. you. Um, it, uh, there's companies like NTE out there that, are developing high-speed switching rectifiers with low uh, current gates, low voltage gates, and uh, like Linear Technologies has a chip now, they call an energy harvesting chip. As of about two and a half years ago, um, uh, John Arthur, you know, sh uh, showed off one on an evening thing about a few years back, and last year or two years ago, we talked about the uh, energy harvesting chip. But what it does is that the subtle fields that uh, uh, a conductor and a conductor, wait a minute, is an antenna a conductor? A monopole? It is, isn't it? EM fields passing through there. We could take a monopole and, you know, and it could, if we have something, you know, those, it's a subtle field, but if we have something that can capture the back and forth, you know, the, you know, the fluctuations, and we can pump that circuit up, you know, and get it to flow through the rectifiers, and charge a capacitor, then we can harvest it. So it's all about the check valve and the short and the storage battery. In this case, we use a capacitor. Now, 
There's a lot of EM fields out there that, like David said earlier, we haven't, we haven't really mapped them all out like the... So, like subtle you know, energy fields or ether yeah, fields. Yeah, like the, you know, and right now the ether is one of the uh, terms that, it's one of the things we use to apply to a lot of the, and there are some people that, because they, they don't, they, they know it's there, they see it, they've got something coming out of it, but they don't know where it's coming from. So they, there's a lot of folks, very honorable, very upright, they just throw it in the category of the ether. Um, uh, the true definition of the ether, well, I guess we've yet to come to that, haven't we? Mm. It's, it's kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of a broad uh, 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 term right now. Uh, but see, uh, that's the exciting part. And some of these that not only harvest or interact with a, an yeah, EM field, yeah. but harvest and, when I say harvest, and potentially do what? Focus it, you know. You know, um, where's the mouse? Um, okay, uh, RGB one on the. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, we got to go back in the presentation. Um, yeah, I got a little more to okay, do. Okay, yeah, I know. Uh, go uh, and then select the uh, video selector to uh, A, please. And uh, now. Um, I'm going to back up here, and I, I'm, I'm hoping I'm not stealing some of his thunder, because some of, okay, no, here we are, oh yes, okay, look at that, um, where's the magic uh, pointer thingy, thing of my do jobber here, is that the, okay, now, look at that, we have something, does that look like an antenna, now, we all know that different antennas interact with different EM fields, and the structures that, you know, monopole, dipole, Yagi's, you know, I mean, you know, I, I'm an antenna theory fanatic, you know, I'm, I, yeah, I'm on the 12-step program. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm on the first step. I've admitted I'm a recovering fanatical scientist, a researcher. Um, I've never got past the first step. I can just admit it, you know. It's a, that's all the I got. But look at this. Is that, okay. Collecting. I do want to mention that these are bent down 72 degrees. I didn't okay. say that in my construction. These first coils are designed to catch the incoming waves, the right, left, right, left, right, left, and then the secondary three coils are bent up 72 degrees totally. So that's something I just want to get on record uh, so people making these know. You have to bend them down by hand after you've made them, and again, use the 3, 1, 1, 5, 6, 12, 1 bending right, you know, ratio when you do it. And uh, that would okay. be the final construct to this antenna. Yeah. So uh, the control group here and the treat treatment group, we've got the collector and the emitter. Uh, it's harvesting it and focusing it, okay? Now, some of these EM fields, um, uh, how many electronic engineers, electrical engineers do we have in the crowd? Anybody that's a radio uh, engineer, anybody got FCC licenses or radio? Okay. Um, the size and type of antenna, uh, if you have a communication or some little data burst of energy that you're trying to send, how critical is having the antenna the right length or the right, you know, how important is the design and size of the antenna for what you're trying to receive? Very important. That's, that is, it's actually the name of the game, isn't it? It's the whole shoot and match, not just part of it. So there's all kinds of strong fields, weak fields out there that we're learning how to capture. And as strange as it sounds, the energy sometimes that comes back out of it, you know, now let me see. There's a... Uh, it's true, John. Some of these, the bigger ones I make, some, they don't work very well. Sometimes the smaller ones work better. Because I think they, they resonate with the shape of the wave better. Have you, have you ever tried to tune a monopole? Have you ever tried to tune a monopole by resizing it? You know, just a regular straight-up antenna? Yeah, vertical antenna. Now, how, how do we tune it? We change the size, don't we? You know what? How do you tune a, a short-wave antenna? Change the length, right? Okay, change the size, change the length, and... 
it receives that specific frequency better, okay? And you can harvest better by changing the size of the antenna and the configuration. Well, that's what this is doing, except uh, when, we're, when we're looking at this right here, you know, like we we're talking about the human body, well, that's just a biological organism, isn't it? Oh, wait a minute, that's, those are biological organisms also. Oh, the molecular structures are polar in them too. Imagine that. And we figured out a way to collect some energy, excite the natural, which is already going on, and uh, cause it to increase the, uh, the strength and productivity there. So what's happening is that uh, we're actually, are we inventing something new? No, we're just making what's already there work better, okay? You know, and uh, some of those who went to the 2010 ET, you, you know, probably remember uh, there was a thing that I, uh, I got a hole in me. <laughs> I was the dubious recipient of a, um, uh, a mortar, a misfire on a mortar round at a demonstration. And uh, um, something picked me up, tossed me about eight or ten feet and set me on fire and my clothes. And I kind of looked a little bit like Al Jolson, you know. And, uh, you know, and I had this big hole in me and they said it was going to take quite a few uh, plastic surgeries in a minimum 18 to 24 months. And if you go get Jamie Buterf's DVD from 2010, you'll see, um, and there's also one uh, 432 megahertz uh, healing on YouTube. And Jamie actually put up the little clip, but that was all electromagnetic mm -hmm. healing. And, you know, and... Uh, yeah, let me finish up with these. More of the rodent. Yeah, well, this is sort of a coil that's uh, it's along the rodent coil parameters, but this is, a, I did want to mention, these fractal patterns that I was talking about earlier can not only be used for sanding mirrors and symbols, but you can make magnetic windings out of them. So you take a piece of copper wire and wind it three times on one side, once on the other, then once on this side, then five on here, and then six on here, and then twelve on here, and then one on here. And again, it makes those, um, what did you call them, fields? Uh, Bifiler fields, yeah, it creates bifiler fields. And I've had some wild results with uh, magnetic windings. Yeah. Um, some of them I haven't been able to repeat, but some of them I have. I, I, one time I think I saw some ether actually pile up on the end of a magnetic winding, and it looked like transparent Best glistening honey almost. First. Kind of, you know, uh, like translucent honey. You could see right through it, but it kind of was iridescent. It dripped off the end of the winding, hit the floor, and it actually oxidized the floor where it hit the floor. And uh, other weird, you know, experiences like that. So I think you can also capture the ether with magnetic windings. I really haven't gone into that deeply because um, I'm a little embarrassed talking about experiences I haven't been able to repeat. But uh, if anybody wants to get into this, I would suggest magnetic windings is a great uh, potential as well as, you know, the ether coil. Make windings using these patterns. And you'll get Show one of the other results. coils you have. Hmm? Don't, don't you have another coil? Yeah, this is uh, another coil. And uh, if John's done, uh, you know, when he's done, I want to take you all outside and throw these mirrors in a bucket of water, run a little current through them, and see if there's any photon, uh, you know, resonance. After, after the session's over, we're, we're going to go, we'll, we'll set up a pop-up outside, and we've got a little tray of water out there, and we're going to... Maybe play with some salt and some crystals and yeah, I'll skip yeah, and the just salt. That didn't work at all yesterday. May, and so. maybe some optical refraction to see. Yeah, the what, optical refraction I, I might work know. today. No. Maybe if the sun's a little lower, it might work yeah. better. And just so everybody knows, I'm looking for financial backing for research into this work. Uh, I've done all Mr. Wizard experiments as best as I can, and uh, I really could use some serious money and equipment to uh, pursue this research because I think there's. Anti-gravity potential, free energy potential, well, the three potential, field, yeah. Um, even uh, dare I say, interdimensional travel and communication faster than light potential. So, but it just would take a little bit of backing and uh, a small amount of real lab equipment to get started and get going. So I am unshy in asking for my financial backing. You know, today there are a lot of uh, a lot of researchers that have seen something that they can't explain with words, but they know exists. Remember Einstein, he understood relativity and special relativity cognitive, cognitively, but he couldn't put it into words, you know, and um, 
a lot of so there are some people, psychologists, that'll classify that. <clears throat> Excuse me, John. That's a right brain, left brain thing, and the, it's like the women see everything as a holistic picture. They can see five apples laying there, and they don't have to go one plus one plus one. They just see it, and they say five. You know, the men say one plus one plus you know two, three, four, and they count them. And they, but um, Elsa, uh, his first wife, had the math background. She was the one that was able to prove that what he already saw was real. There's a lot of researchers, you know, and us in our daily lives. Have you ever seen something or felt something that, you know, I know there's something there and it's, and it's powerful. Actually, John, can I put the, the math on? I got one page of math here. Yeah, yeah, let's uh, the record. Um, go back to uh, RGB1 and uh, A, please. Okay, uh, that, yeah, there should let be. Me, let me just show some math at the very end here that, uh, I didn't work this all out by myself. My good buddy who's back east and in ill health right now helped me. And he was really the brains behind a lot of this math. Um, here's a little more math that uh, science needs to incorporate. We were taught in school, uh, just getting back to this presentation real quick, that at 5 to 9 you round up and from 4 to 1 you round down. And when you hit 0, you do nothing. But as I discussed earlier, 0 is just a probability envelope. It's looking at something and saying, we can't see anything, so we'll call it absolute nothing. But we know darn well, in reality, there's something there that is too small to be observed, so we call it zero. So the way numbers should be rounded off is five to nine up, four to zero down. That'll give you much more accurate um, mathematical results. And that is the scientific way to round off numbers. Our number system was created by merchants to calculate money flow. And uh, they figured out how to round off numbers, not scientists. So this would be the scientific way to do it. And uh, this is really some Einsteinian math we worked out. Um, e equals mc to c uh, to phi squared. This is phi times phi, which is 2.618. And um, that is the, um, oh, what is that? That's pi to the 13th which is the speed of light times gravity equals that number at the very far bottom there, pi to the 13th, which is a little more than coincidence, I think. I think that can be, I'm not sure what it means, but I think that can be uh, maneuvered into modern science very easily. I think it describes the shape of the universe. And uh, E equals pi, uh, E equals mc to phi squared, not just c squared, but phi squared which is, you know, instead of C to the second, it would be C to the 2.618. And equals MC to phi squared there. Okay, you got that. And um, so that would mean that, you know, it's not just E equals MC squared. The photons don't go along and then split. That would be squared. They go along and split, and each one twists a different direction. That's where the phi comes into the C squared equation. And all numbers are fractal. Uh, every number goes on forever. There is no round number. 1 equals 1.1111. 1 uh, 2 equals 2.2222. So all real measurements are fractal. They go on forever. They don't end in zero or they don't end. They keep going on. Even though you may not be able to see anything down there for a long time, they continue on. So if you fractate all your numbers, you take a, you have a 3 as an observation and you turn it into 3.3333. If you take all your data, and fractate it and make them fractal numbers, do your calculations and then unfractate it, boil them back down to the original um, unit number, if you will, unit data number, the results will be a little different but more accurate than ever. Uh, the universe resonates in seven. This has to do with the, the, spi the um, spikes in the spiral. It goes in, piles up, backs up a little bit, goes in again, backs up a little bit. So it takes four steps. This is what time does. Takes four steps forward, three steps back. Four steps forward, three steps back. So that's the way time actually works at 600 billion times a second. And uh, we'll skip that one. And um, this is just to say quantum entanglement is actually the two particles never leave each other. The universe implodes in between them. So when two particles split, they're really standing still. Space time rushes in between them. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. I would like to take everybody yeah. outside. And uh, if anybody's ever had, if anybody has ever just had the frustrating feeling that you've never seen energy from the ether, well, tonight 
or today we're going to resolve that. And you can no longer say that you've never seen energy from the ether. <laughs> Got blue. Yeah. <laughs> Energy from the ether. <laughs> David Garraway, thank you, ladies thank and gentlemen. You. Pleasure being here. And okay, I hope you'll all accompany me outside for a, a last minute uh, attempted experiment, an attempted demo. It's gonna take it's gonna take us about three to five minutes to get set up out there. Um, if you let's let's have, how about if we have them be there in ten? Okay. That'll that'll give I you hope time come to out and give it a shot. Uh, to uh, uh, take your comfort if you need to, uh, get some uh, soda or something to drink, and then we're gonna meet